Sound good? Thank you, Becca. And you're live. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sheila Raymond. Um, we need to go ahead and start this meeting. I call it to order at 3.30. Um, today is March 17th, 2021. The first order that we need to do is do a roll call of attendance. Chair Sheila Raymond, present. Vice Chair Janet Smigelski. Present. Sam Campana. Present. Sheila Collins. Present. Rita Hartman. Present. Fred Klein. We're waiting on Fred. Marna McClendon. Present. And with that, we will move into the agenda. The first item is the public comment. Kira, did we have any that I'm, I didn't see any that I'm aware of? Chair Raymond, we do not have any public comment for the live meeting. Okay. Then the next part is to address the minutes from the February 17th, 2021 meeting. Uh, we need to approve those meeting, excuse me, those minutes. Um, this is for discussion and possible action. Does anyone have any comments that they'd like to make or any problems with the minutes they'd like, like to address? Uh, this is Janet Smigelski. I would like to have the minutes corrected under um, item 10, board members' reports. Um, they are the finalists for the dollar Southwest Literacy Grant, the friends. And the group funds to help. The last sentence should be, they're not raising, they're hoped to be raising funds to help with the installation that lost at Rio Montana. Those are corrections. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Anyone else? Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from February 17th? I make a motion. This is Janet Smigelski. I may approve. May I get a second? Marna McClendon I'll seconds. Thank you, Marna. Uh, we need to do a, a roll call vote. So we'll go through Sheila Raymond. Aye. Janet Smigelski. Aye. Sam Campana. Aye. Sheila Collins. Aye. Frida Hartman. Aye. Fred Klein. We're still waiting for him to attend. Marta McClendon. Aye. There we go. We have the meeting, the minutes approved with the changes that Janet brought to our attention. And Chair Raymond, Fred Klein is now in attendance. I just let him into the meeting. Great. Welcome, Thank Fred. you. Welcome, Fred. We're glad Thank you. Here. Sorry. Not Sorry a problem. Um, let's go into the agenda on item one. It's addressing the draft of the Scottsdale General Plan 2035. Adam Yaron is the principal planner and Taylor Reynolds, the project coordination liaison. And they're going to present and discuss the case 1-GP-2021 draft Scottsdale General Plan 2035 with the library board. This is for information, discussion, and possible action with a roll call vote. Um, just a point of clarification, I represented the library board with the um, Citizen Review Committee and did have a part of this in this, um, full disclosure. So Adam and Taylor, you guys want to go ahead and address this? Sure. Thank you for uh, coming. Yeah, thank you for having me, uh, Chair Ryman. This is uh, Taylor Reynolds with Long Range Planning. I'll be doing the presentation today, and Ad Adam's on the line as well. Um, again, Case 1GP 2021, the draft Scottsdale General Plan 2035. I'll briefly be going over high level, uh, you know, the general plan process, the citizen review committee process, and then we'll go over briefly over some of the uh, some um, some things in the draft plan that are relevant to the library board. Next slide, please. 
So in terms of what is a general plan, it is the community-wide vision. It's a, it's a city policy document um, and contains community-wide goals uh, affecting various aspects of the city and guides decision-making for uh, city council as well as boards and commissions and even staff. Uh, what it is not, it is not a zoning ordinance, so it is not regulatory, it is not rigid or static, so it can be uh, legally amendable. And it is not just a land use map, as, it's, as I stated, it does cover a broad a, a variety of topics. Next slide. Arizona State Statutes provides that uh, a general plan is required of the city of Scottsdale and it is effective up to 10 years. Uh, an update process is also required every 10 years and that update process includes enhanced public outreach planning commission recommendation and city council adoption. And if city council is to adopt such an updated plan, it goes before voters for their possible ratification. So in 2001, that general plan was adopted uh, at the end of 2001 in October and ratified by public vote in 2002. Next slide. In terms of the initial update of the plan that occurred between the years of 2009 and 2011, it included a 19 member general plan working group, uh, not too dissimilar from the citizen review committee and that we had one person from each board and commission uh, working to update that plan. There was extensive public cities, uh, citywide public outreach. Um, and that, can, that uh, plan actually went through um, the update process in terms of going before planning commission and city council for uh, adoption, which occurred in 2011. Next slide. However, in terms of when it went before the public for vote, it was not ratified at the special election in 2012, uh, as you can see by a factor of 2%. And as such, the 2001 general plan still remains in effect today. Next slide. To continue uh, the update of the initial 2001 general plan, there was a 2035 general plan update process where we had a general plan uh, task force um, that worked on an update to this plan through uh, uh, 32 public meetings. That plan um, went through a public outreach process. Uh, and as you can see, an extensive amount of public outreach process but it did not go through that public hearing process that I spoke to several slides ago. So it did not go before um, planning commission or city council for adoption. So as such, this plan has been utilized as the baseline plan for the citizen review committee and their review. And as you'll see, a good amount of the hard work that was put into the draft by the task force was either upheld or reinforced by the more recent uh, work completed by the citizen review committee. Next slide. Uh, this slide represents the boards and commissions that uh, were seated on the citizen review committee. We had 13 uh, from this broad variety of uh, boards and commissions. The library, the library board, again, was represented by Chair Raymond. Next slide. As you can see here, the citizen review committee uh, met throughout 2020, even through uh, COVID restrictions via electronic meetings and completed their charge by reviewing the entire draft plan. This was inclusive of review of and consideration. Uh, as you can see here, a large number of public comments submitted. You can see that over 300 uh, comments were received and reviewed by the citizen uh, review committee, which they did go through line by line as Chair Raymond could attest to in some uh, marathon meetings that we had. This ensured that the draft plan was up to date, incorporated uh, more clarity, and where necessary, incorporated new goals and policies as, see, as, as the Citizen Review Committee saw fit. As we go through this presentation, I'll be including some highlights of some of the major updates that were brought forward um, as the result of this process, uh, really specific to your, uh, to your board's purview. Next slide. In terms of where we are in the time, timeline here, uh, the Citizen Review Committee completed their work program within phase three, and we are now in phase four, undertaking that state required adoption process that I've uh, spoken about in previous slides. This includes robust public outreach, um, and, and again, going before Planning Commission for recommendation and City Council for their review and possible adoption of the plan. Next slide. For the formatting of the plan, as you can see here, there's three main sections, um, but the most important of which is section two, where all the elements are housed within chapters. Um, 
uh, there are 23 elements, 17 of which are state mandated. So there are six community created elements. Three of them um, are new to the general plan and three were brought forward um, from the 2001 uh, general plan. But most important of which is the uh, new tourism element, which was penned by the, by the citizen review committee. Next slide. Um, so for this slide, um, this represents kind of a legend uh, to follow along with to uh, if you are reviewing the citizen review committee's uh, draft plan, you can see the coloration here aligns with the various input that went into updating the plan. Um, so on these spreads, you can see that blue aligns with citizen review committee modifications that they came up with. Green was a citizen or sorry, city staff input into the plan that the citizen review committee uh, brought into the plan. And red is citizen input uh, that again came from the public and the citizen review committee uh, reviewed. As I stated, we had over 300 comments. So they reviewed that input and in some instances they uh, incorporated it into the draft plan. So in the coming slides, we'll briefly review sections again of the draft plan that relate to the library board. Um, next slide, please. First element we will discuss is the healthy community element, which seeks to maintain Scottsdale's leadership role in health and human services, responding to the needs of families, um, taking care of our neighbors and our elders and promoting lifelong learning and providing opportunities for the youth to grow and become leaders of the future. This is not a state statute required element, but is community created initially by um, the general plan task force in 2014. And it, ha it has been reinforced by the citizen review committee here um, of note to the library board in particular is goal H HC4, we will, what, which we will get to on the next slide, please. So on this slide uh, on the bottom in, in particular is policy HC 4.2, which is new to the plan and discusses promoting libraries as destinations for learning and mental growth. So this, this goal is not in the existing 2001 plan and would be new uh, for the city. Um, next slide, please. Next is the recreation element, which discusses the city's recreational facilities and programs and how they provide for leisure and fitness needs of Scottsdale's current and future generations. This element is state statute required. And furthermore, the specific goal R3 that we will, we will be discussing providing recreational diversity um, is required as well. Next slide. So on the bottom left, uh, goal R3 topically covers state statute requirements discussing providing recreational opportunities. Um, of note to the library board is policy R3.6 on the right side of the screen, which is new and was drafted by the task force and reinforced by the CRC. And it generally discusses the provision of uh, providing quiet spaces in, in libraries to accommodate passive recreation. Next slide. Next is the public services and facilities element, which uh, provides guidance about the provision of program services and physical facilities that protect, serve to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. This is another state statute required element um, and of importance to the library board is goal PSF4, which directly relates to the provision of a library system for the community. Next slide. So goal PSF4, which you can see is on the bottom left-hand portion of the screen, has largely been, been reinforced as a CRC. As you can see, there are not a lot of um, colorized changes um, incorporated by the CRC, um, other than some additional text to PSF4 regarding social service providers. Um, it also contains two new policies not found in our existing 2001 general plan, which are PSF4.6 and 4.7 which generally discuss supporting non-English speaking customers, as well as developing partnerships and growth of library services. Next slide, please. Next within, the, we have the uh, public buildings element. It, it acknowledges the vital role that public buildings play in the shaping of community life and further seeks to design facilities that represent the community's special qualities. This is state statutes required as well and provides goals and policies generally discussing public buildings um, and not so specific to the library in general. However, of importance to your board is the community centers and libraries map. Uh, map. Uh, next slide, which is a state statute required aspect of this element. 
So the statutes require that a public buildings element show locations of civic and community centers, such as libraries. And as you can see, this map does just that and uh, was updated uh, by the CRC to ensure locations were up to date. Next slide. Finally, we have the implementation chapter, which is new to the general plan. And it provides clarity of the purpose of the general plan, which is guiding more specific efforts that may be undertaken by city departments, city council, or even boards and commissions. Relevant to the library board is the ongoing library program item, which you can see is uh, two thirds of the way down of the list. Next slide. This timeline uh, highlights the amount of public outreach opportunities that will be available over the coming months, um, inclusive of that state statute required general plan adoption process. Again, that includes planning commission uh, recommendation and possible adoption by city council in June, which would align us with consideration of ratification at the next available election of November of this year. Next slide. Again, we have ongoing opportunities for folks to provide input, um, keyword general plan updates, um, we just had a series of virtual online open houses for folks to participate in. We have an ongoing, as you can see on this slide, uh, process for folks to provide written comment on specific elements of the plan. Um, and we're trying to take, get as much input as we can and forward it to uh, Planning Commission and City Council. Next slide. So this concludes staff's presentation. Again, I'd like uh, to highlight the effort and input provided by the Citizen Review Committee and even more so specifically by your board through Chair Ryman. Um, if there's further input the board would like to provide, staff is here to collect such um, and forward again to Planning Commission and City Council for their further consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask or have you had a chance to look at the general plan? Are you familiar with what it is? Um, those are kind of the questions here. No questions, comments. Um, Taylor, when we go through this, I do have one question. Um, as a board member, are we encouraged to reach out to the community to talk about the general plan or is not, that not something that we need to be doing? That didn't sound right. Do we need to go out and support, promote, you know, communicate with other people in our community? I guess that's a better question. Uh Chair, Chair Raymond, this is uh, Adam, uh, long, range, uh, long Range Planning. Uh, thanks for the question. Just wanted to respond to that. With respect to um, uh, board members here on the call who haven't had a chance yet to review uh, what was provided in your agenda packet, you can certainly provide additional input on the plan by going to scottslaz.gov keyword general plan updates and provide individual um, comments with respect to um, the plan and, and bringing education and awareness to, to folks uh, to either participate uh, ahead of the planned uh, adoption, which would take place in June. Certainly that's possible uh, uh, as well as uh, after the process uh, up until and through the voter ratification process. Thank you, Adam. And yes, they were marathon meetings, but you did a great job. So thank you. Thank you okay, for, um, for all the time you gave, uh, Chair Raymond. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does any, I don't know that we need to do a roll call vote. There isn't really an action for us. This was more of information. Kira, would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Okay. Oh, I will you. say we've been working on that long range general plan for all <laughs> decades. <Yeah. laughs> this is Sam. So Thank congratulations. You. Good work. I, you know, I audited a couple of those and it was really impressive. Thank you again for all your hard work. Yes, they did a great job. Third time's okay. a charm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Delman, for coming in and uh, sharing this information. The next Thank item you. on our agenda is the State Library Report Overview. Natalie Mitchell is serving in a deployment capacity as the management an analyst and will review the annual State Library Report. This is for information and discussion. Uh, we do have yeah, the library part there. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for coming today. 
Um, and Chair Raymond, this is Kira Peters. Unfortunately, Natalie is out today, and I told her that okay. I would cover her presentation. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to do the best that I can and answering any questions. So um, sorry that Natalie's not here, but let me launch into this. And really, part of the reason we wanted to share this with the library board is a lot of work goes into this annual state library report, and all that work was done by Natalie with input from the senior library managers. So um, I commend Natalie for her good work in this brief presentation. Presentation. So we really just wanted to share this information with you so that you are aware that it happens and, and what it means and how we use it. So next slide, please, Amy. So really just an overview of, of what, this, what this looks like and how the library government agencies fall. You'll see here that there's the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences at the federal level, at the state level, the Arizona State Library, Archives and Public Records, and then there's the local, the local section, which is where the local libraries fall into place. And there we are, Scottsdale Public Library. Next slide, Amy. So this slide here, what is it? Um, and I'm not going to read it verbatim. I know that you guys received this prior to the meeting. Um, but basically, the Arizona State Library collects, edits, and disseminates statistical information on public libraries in the state. So it's really nice to be able to have this information and that we can compare between public libraries. Um, why do we do it? Uh, the reason why we do it, the goal is that the data with a brief analysis and summary will assist libraries to analyze community needs, plan services, and use the data to inform budgets and grant applications as they track their data over time and compare that data to other libraries serving similar, po similar populations. And there, right, is the link, if, if the link to uh, this report if you want to take time later to look, look it over in detail. Next slide, Amy. So here's just a snapshot of some of the things that you can see in the state library statistics, and this is from fiscal year 1819. Kind of interesting to see overall within the state what is happening. Those are some pretty impressive numbers. Um, total circulation, transactions for physical and e-circulation, that's, you know, 45 million. Registered users, over 3 million. They even call out central libraries, branches, and then as detailed as librarians with master's degrees. So just a snapshot of some of the information that you can find in the state report. Next slide, Amy. Um, state report data comparisons. I know that Natalie put this in here just to show how we as the Scottsdale Public Library can use this information that we can compare with cities that are close to us or that we might think have similar populations. Um, so right here is just a little look at population served, um, physical circulation, e-circulation, and total circulation per capita. And she noted here Scottsdale Public, Chandler Public, and Glendale Public Library. So you can see how we compare to those library systems by looking at the state report data comparison. Next slide, Amy. Might even be, I think that actually is the conclusion that is slide. It, yes. That is it. So it was brief um, library board, but we did want to let you know that we work on it. This, um, this report was actually submitted. Let me refer to um, my notes here. This state report was completed in November and it was submitted um, in December of this year. So Thank you, Natalie, for her work on that. And again, this was just an informational item for the library board to share information about this important report and how libraries use it. So thank you. And thank I'd be you, happy Kira. to answer, answer any questions. This is Sheila Raymond. Just a comment on, excuse me, our e-circulation compared to Chandler and Glendale. Yes. Wow. Yes, yes. I see that right there too. 635,000 comparatively. And I do see here, I'm monitoring the board. I believe that, um, Frida Hartman, do you also have a question? Yes, I do. Um, I have a couple of questions actually. Um, one is, have there been any efforts uh, in trying to connect with the other public libraries in the state so that there would be some type of joint meeting or some type of collaboration or sharing or anything of that nature? Yes, um, 
board member Hartman, we do do that. I, the city of Scottsdale, Scottsdale Public Library is part of the Maricopa County Library um, group. And so I go to meetings once a month. Actually, there is one tomorrow that I need to try to make. And it has library directors from across the state that are, that are part of that group. And at those meetings um, now lately, it's been all focused on COVID and how the different cities and their libraries are serving communities through COVID-19. But yes, we do get together with that group. And I know that Becky has a staff member that um, meets with um, e-resources team. Um, that might be a little bit different than the Maricopa County Library, but there's a lot of collaboration between the public libraries. Um, even with vaccinations happening, um, you know, I have relationships to where I can send an email to the director in Chandler, or I can, you know, send an email to the director in Phoenix. So I have to say very proud of a nice relationship with all the library systems and uh, everybody's been very willing to share information um, to help each other out as we serve communities through uh, COVID-19 specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that um, seems like it might be a very valuable item to include in the um, state library report. You know, the, the various um, uh, ways that the libraries uh, come together and work together or collaborate. I'm just wondering if that is something that uh, would be considered in the future to continue growing this report in content. And um, I will say that it's really the state library that has a template that asks for very specific questions. And without having the entire report in front of me, I can look to see if that's one of their questions. Um, I do know that all the public libraries input into that, um, but I don't know if that exact, that exact topic is included, but we can certainly check and, and very good feedback. Okay. Yeah, I think that would really be a value uh, and, and really something to hold up as a point of pride you know, that, that there is a collaboration uh, between the libraries there and, and, and a lot of communication. My other comment on that one was, is there any um, relationship or similar kind of connection between the libraries in Maricopa County and the other ones in the state? Board member Hartman, can you repeat that question one more time? Similarities between the libraries in the state, is that the question? Uh, the, the, is there any similar kind of, uh, you mentioned about Maricopa County uh, and the libraries within Maricopa County coming together, library directors. Yes. Is there anything similar on the state level so that all libraries in the state and their directors would come together at some point? You know, I would probably answer that by, I mean, and now it's been COVID, but that would probably be the um, local conference, the state library conference. Um, would probably be the best time that library directors get together and talk. Uh, Becky or Melissa, you might be able to help me answer that one as well. Um, I'm very familiar with the MCLC group, which is the Maricopa County, but outside of the conference, I don't think there's something uh, with the state. Am I correct in saying that? Sure, this is Melissa. Uh, there are several groups that meet, uh, not only you with the library directors, but we also have groups and Maricopa County is part of that. So it is a consortium of uh, libraries around the state. Um, I meet regarding continuing education for staff, uh, for working with the public. And as you said, Becky has a staff member who works on the collection, all of our e uh, and physical resources that we have. Uh, so we do have that main group, the MCLC, that works very closely with all of the participating uh, libraries in the state, and the majority of them do participate. And Kira, I'd also add, on a national level, we're part of the ULC, so we connect and communicate with mm -hmm. libraries across the country, country through that method as well. Mm -hmm. But in, order, but in answering to Frida's question, probably the AZLA too, the Arizona Library Association would be another kind of more state to answer the questions, state get together. Right. Is there anything having to do with similar gatherings of library board members? That is a great question. I would have to do some research off the top of my head. Um, I, I am not aware of any, but I could be wrong, but I can, I can put that down in the notes to check because that's a really good question. Excellent. Thank you so much. You're I'm not welcome. sure every library has a board, so we'd have to look into that. To every that, system yeah. has a board, yeah. 
And Kira, some of those boards are not meeting during this time, especially during COVID. Um, so I'm aware that a lot of them have not been meeting, but uh, not all of them uh, do have boards, as Mandy said. Right. Okay. Library board. I will ask, though. That's a great question. Um, so I do not see any other hands raised relative to the agenda. Oh. Oh, Frida, is, is that yours is still up from before? There we go, down. So um, that is that for that agenda item, Chair Raymond. Thank you, Kira. Um, <clears throat> item number three is the adult literacy programming. Aaron Krauss Riley, adult services correct, excuse me, coordinator, will present information on adult literacy programming. This is for information and discussion. Hello, Aaron. Thank you for coming today. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I am going to provide some information about uh, the programs that we have that support adult literacy. And it really spills over into being an overview of all of the programming we do because we, um, in each and every program we plan, we intend to support adult literacy. Happily in Scottsdale uh, as a city, we have um, a 97% rate of high school graduation among the adults in our population. and and over 58% uh, college graduation rate in the adults in our population. So in general, um, literacy isn't something we're, we're starting or um, having to assist people with, but it is something that we try to help maintain and support through our enrichment programs. Um, in some cases, um, as you'll see, the first item on my slide is um, an English as a second language book discussion group, which was, um, a group that was funded through um, an LSTA grant we received last year for um, a learning language lounge space, which has been put up in our loft uh, upstairs area. Um, but unfortunately it was opened just as the pandemic struck. And so we have um, only had a limited opportunity to use that um, because um, English literacy is a way that we try to reach some of our underserved population and hit some of the um, people who are not um, high school and college degree holders um, and who are new to our city. Um, we have provided um, ESL classes and the book discussion group was a way to further um, literacy for people who had gone beyond just the basics of learning language and communication, but really wanted to study literature. And that was developed by a couple of volunteers who had been teaching ESL classes for us and saw a need and uh, approached me when I was developing that grant. And we thought it was a great thing to roll into that. Um, in addition, uh, during 2019 and 2020, we um, held a pilot program for an adaptive services book discussion group. And that was a collaboration by a couple of our librarians with um, the Community Services Adaptive Services Center uh, for the city of Scottsdale. Um, they had done a little research and found um, that in offering, um, you know, actual literacy training and actual um, chances to help people who were not used to being able to have a book discussion group or who had not been considered um, eligible for something like literature discussion, um, they wanted to reach out to some of the um, patrons of uh, the city's adult service, uh, adaptive services group, which covers um, all kinds of mental and physical and other challenges that people face for the city. It's a great part of our community services team. Um, so the librarians collaborated um, with uh, people who, the social workers who work with some of the patrons of the Adaptive Services Center and held a weekly book club um, for six months. And that also would have continued had we not um, been struck with COVID. We had um, 11, uh, traditional book discussion groups spread across um, the uh, branches of the library. Um, we had uh, some at each branch, which is very nice, and they each had an individual personality. They ranged from um, a cookbook discussion group, uh, where the uh, participants shared not only uh, talked about cookbooks, but shared recipes and snacks when that was um, something that we could do uh, before the pandemic. Um, that has happily continued as a virtual book club, as has uh, another one of the book clubs out of um, the Arabian Library, led by one of our librarians, Sarah Shetler. Um, her group, uh, which was called the Arabian Nights Book Club, um, didn't miss a beat. I think they missed maybe 
one or two meetings at the most uh, before they took their book club to Zoom. Um, and they've had it continue ever since. And in fact, um, both of those book clubs out of Arabia and have added members or added members back who were no longer able to attend because of they weren't local anymore. But once they knew they were online, they were able to get back and join the groups. Um, the other in-person book clubs uh, that we've had have been um, suspended until we can get back to our regular um, in-person programming. But the library staff did develop um, virtual book discussion groups. Um, both of those were developed this year, um, started from scratch by um, librarians. And one of our librarians named Mike McCullian um, is a part-time library assistant at Civic Center. He started a classics book club, uh, which took off. Um, he did it all over Teams and uh, was able to advertise on social media. Um, he went out and also, um, you know, talked to people he knew, uh, dropped off information at bookstores and things like that so that people would join the virtual book discussion. Then he handed that off to a teammate and started another one, um, at the beginning of this year, which is a science fiction book discussion group. And that one is moving along very well also. Um, so we really tried to maintain the opportunity for people to read and discuss books um, because that's a really important part of the social function the library provides. And it's been something that's popular in both the traditional and virtual format. Uh, moving into other virtual programming that we've done, um, we received another LSTA grant this year uh, funded by um, the initial CARES uh, grant funding uh, for uh, items like uh, technology to be able to film programs for both adult and youth services. Um, I will just can concentrate on the adult services programming. We've developed a series of programs called Books and More. Um, which uh, is a group of programs that are run out of the individual branches at the library. So we started with the Civic Center program, which is called Get Lit. And um, then we also have the Mustang program, which is called In the Stacks. And recently we added a new program from the Arabian Library called Turning the Page. Each of these programs is run by the librarians um, on the adult services team at each branch. Um, the teams have really overcome a lot of challenges in learning how to use um, technology, learning how to be filmmakers basically and produce videos. Um, the topics of the videos range from virtual programs that are available to people um, at the library, um, their book recommendations, uh, they do uh, discussions, contests, all kinds of things that we would do if we were having um, in-person programming in the library. And they managed to wrap it up in under a half an hour uh, a week. And at this point we are doing a program every week um, and two weeks out of the month we do two programs. And once um, Appaloosa has had a chance to get used to the schedule they've got going with the brand new um, Pony Express, uh, they will be adding a program as well so that all of our branches are represented. Um, each branch uh, program has a flavor of the branch and it's really nice to see how each of the groups has gone off and developed specialties just like they do when they're working with patrons in person and when they do visual displays and things like that. It's been a really great experience. And I'm so proud of the staff for being able to put the programs together and basically learn an entirely new skill set. Uh, and it's been something that's popular with the patrons. The programs are linked through our online calendar. We've done some um, flyers that we've handed out in support of this at the drive up windows and curbside pickup. And um, the programs are available archived on our YouTube channel. We do Facebook and other social media promotion for them as well. And we've really been happy with the results there. Um, we talked about our dig digital literacy just a little bit. You saw how well um, our library does in, um, you know, having the digital circulation and that's um, owed in great part to the adult services librarian, uh, Bethany Ronberg, who is our e-resources librarian. She really has done everything she can to not only get the best resources for our patrons, but to make sure that staff is continuously um, 
trained and updated on every little nuance of delivering digital library resources, uh, which include not only books and audiobooks, which are by far our most popular, but also include um, movies and uh, music and other streaming services, um, including uh, some of you may use our Acorn um, streaming TV uh, subscriptions, which I use, I re-up it every week regularly because it's such a nice thing. They have a lot of great programming that supports a lot of the other books and media that we have um, in the library. Um, Bethany also offers um, tutorials for um, patrons. Uh, when we were having patrons in the library and meeting one-on-one, -on -one, she scheduled uh, multiple appointments every week and held um, digital uh, tutorials um, at each branch. Um, and then once we had to take everything virtual, she also, you know, honed that skill set and has been doing um, virtual e-media resources classes, which have had great attendance. In addition, um, we've uh, been able to convert our um, computer classes, which are all taught by volunteers, um, from a 10 laptop um, in-class program to an online program, which is currently serving uh, 35 to 55 people per class. Um, we're running about four or five classes a month. Um, the volunteers are gonna take the summer off and in the fall, they're planning to, um, if we're able, go back to doing those basic classes um, in person and then some more advanced skills classes, which allow people to learn PowerPoint and um, how to do you know, great Google searching, um, how to protect and back up their data. Um, those are some of the more high-end classes. And then we you know, teach the nuts and bolts of, how to turn your computer on, how to use a mouse, how to get to Facebook so that you can chat with you know, your family, things like that. Um, in addition, we've um, also been fortunate to have a grant for the last couple of years uh, to be part of a citizen science research project. Um, citizen science, as some of you may know, is uh, crowdsourced scientific research. And um, about five years ago, uh, someone had a brainstorm that one of the best ways to get a crowd who is interested in research uh, was to go to local libraries and provide information about the experiments that were accepting crowd-based resources and um, offer kits and so forth um, that people could use to um, study the environment around them and to uh, study some of the, um, there's uh, an annual um, study that they do where people contribute to um, looking at multiple slides of um, human blood and indicating where um, weak cells are located and all of those slides and everything, uh, which can be researched at a huge volume uh, with libraries participating all over the country, uh, contribute to a great research study that they have published this year. Um, and it's about uh, how people can, how um, the cells that can, that indicate uh, the beginning of Alzheimer's disease can be detected in these um, slides of the bloodstream. Um, and just for fun, in addition to um, enriching and supporting um, the literacy and encouraging people to use the library and enjoy it, um, we've had um, adult and a family film series. And that will be one of the first programs that we resume um, on an in-person basis. We're looking to pilot that again um, in June uh, using the Civic Center Auditorium and looking at observing all of the social distancing and masking requirements, um, adding registration, and that will be in support of our summer reading program, uh, which kicks off um, uh, in June and July. So um, that's what I have to let you know about how we're supporting um, adult literacy uh, through adult programming, and I'm open to any questions or suggestions that you might have for me. Uh, I have some questions. Great. Uh, who am I speaking to again, please? This is Aaron Krauss Riley. I'm the adult services uh, yes. coordinator for the system. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a couple of general questions. Uh, you seem to define adult literacy very broadly uh, mm -hmm. uh, to include all sorts of uh, enrichment, uh, mm -hmm. which is which is fine. Uh, I'm more interested in people who can't read uh, mm -hmm. or can't speak. Uh, right. Do you do you have any idea how many people you say that uh, Scottsdale has a very high literacy rate, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that's true. 
Uh, I, I also know that there's quite a few foreign visitors here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't mean people who are just here for a week or a month. Sure. Uh, uh, whose uh, uh, spouses of uh, people who work here, uh, ASU mm -hmm. connected. Uh, right. How many people are we talking about here that come to the library uh, needing help speaking or reading? I mean, well, what's uh, your guess? My guess, we had um, probably, I would say, between uh, four and 500 people involved in our um, English as a Second Language programs um, during the um, 2019 uh 2020 uh, fiscal years, I would say. Um, and, you know, uh -huh. that was a pretty steady amount. We were running um, 18 to 20 um, English as a second language classes. Um, all of those were taught by volunteers. We had them available at each of our branches. And based on the um, record that we had in serving that population, we applied for and received um, the LSTA grant that funded the book discussion I mentioned at the beginning and also funded um, a space that, um, as I mentioned, just opened upstairs in um, at the Civic Center Library. Uh, that's a foreign, you know, it houses our um, foreign language um, book collection as well as resources for English language learning. Um, you know, workbooks and um, uh, online resources. And then it also is a place for um, citizenship resources for people who may want to branch out from their um, language studies into um, history and civics. So it's not a, it's not a gigantic population um, that we're talking about when compared to the total population of Scottsdale. Um, but as far as serving the ESL population, um, we were actually, we had quite an active program um, before COVID. How do you find these people? Where do we find them? How do you find them? Is How do we find them? Outreach um, involved or they just we, happen we to do wander outreach. in on their own? Um, well, I guess it's a combination of um, all of our library outreach. Um, you know, we're always interested in making sure that we're reaching the people that need us most. Some of the um, information about our English as a second language classes, uh, we had um, advertisements on the trolleys. We reached out to the um, city community centers such as Vista del Camino and Paiute and um, advertised there. Um, the classes were advertised in, um, you know, other, uh, you know, um, city resources um, on our city Facebook, and um, they were advertised, uh, you know, or, or not necessarily marketed, but um, people uh, who were teaching the classes also um, spoke with um, you know, teachers at the community colleges and high schools. Um, and then we did find a lot of people did come to the library seeking this exact kind of um, support. And um, that was where a lot of our base came from. Do you have a roster of volunteers or people who are uh, active in this area? We absolutely do. Yes. Uh -huh. How large is it? Uh, I would say at the, it ranges from 25 to 40 people, depending on the season. Um, a lot of our um, summer uh, classes have not been as successful because a lot of the people, um, you know, who would be studying um, English as a second language are either caregivers or parents. And so their summers are a little more restricted. But um, during the rest of the year, um, as I said, we were running, I would I think it was 15 classes a week just at Civic Center, um, five at Mustang, and um, two or three at each of the other branches. So um, there was a, quite a range of volunteers. Uh, I see there's a heavy uh, emphasis on group activities, which is understandable. You know, you can reach more people that way. But I've done a little of this, and, and the main thing that I've noticed is the great range of abilities among mm -hmm. people who are looking for literacy help. Right. Uh, some, can, some can speak English and can't read. Some can read and can't speak. Right. Uh, some can't do either. And right. That the, 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 that the, there ought to be maybe a more of an emphasis on uh, tutoring, uh, maybe in connection with classes, in support of classes. That was available as well. 
um, you know, the, the volunteers who taught the classes often um, spent several hours on a given day, um, and that included working with small groups who were operating at different literacy levels. Um, they taught people who are just um, very beginning English speakers to people who are more interested in learning um, some of the more uh, specific elements of grammar um, to improve their speech. There were classes directed at um, learning how to read um, you know, documents um, and learning how to read, um, you know, business forms and things like that so that we could specialize. Um, and we also have um, some individualized services that are available through um, our universal class subscription. We have other educational resources and databases that individual volunteers and librarians are able to recommend people mm -hmm. uh, for individualized study. Okay. Uh, did, the, uh, did the virus sharply curtail your activities? Well, the virus uh, caused the city to take the precaution of not allowing the volunteers to um, yeah. work in city buildings. So because this was volunteer taught, um, because this, you know, for multiple reasons, uh, the volunteers, um, many of them specialized and were, um, had education backgrounds, language backgrounds, um, and our staff, um, in both number and expertise isn't necessarily directed at um, English as a second language teaching. Um, we did have, you know, librarian liaisons for each of the branches working with the volunteers. Yeah. Um, but of course, all of our volunteer activities have been significantly curtailed. The only volunteers who have been able to continue to provide services are the ones who were teaching the online classes. And when we um, looked at converting uh, our ESL classes to online classes. Um, we ran a few pilots and talked to some of the volunteers and a lot of them felt that the most important element in reaching some of these people with the service was the, was the individual interaction with the teachers so that the um, working online would be a barrier. Have your volunteers kind of drifted away because of- No. Uh, no, they're still no, we there? Get they're still there. We actually get requests. Um, I actually supervise the systems volunteer supervisor as well. Um, and he gets requests weekly from the volunteers who participated in many of our activities, including ESL. Are you happy with the program as it stands? As it stands right now? Yeah. I'm, I, I mean... Um, Sounds like you are. Well... It's, it's my job. Um, I, I am happy that the librarians and the volunteers mm -hmm. we've been able to keep on have been able to continuously deliver services given the restrictions and precautions against COVID. So yes, I am happy with the program. And I think we had an outstanding program specifically for ESL uh, before COVID hit. Um, and I'm hoping mm -hmm. the volunteers are all very interested in continuing it. Yeah, okay. Well, if you had a wish, what would you, what would you add? If I uh, add program wise? Yes. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I just submitted a grant. Um, I submitted several, but among them, I submitted a grant which would connect um, uh, teens and seniors in an exchange of skills so that uh. um, seniors are able to share some of their uh, the skills that teens may not be able to um, learn. Um, you know, crafting, golfing, um, photography, you know, all kinds of things that people have volunteered to teach. Mm. And teens can share expertise in things like digital literacy, how to yeah. work your phone, how to get on Facebook, um, which yeah. are things yeah. that we often have requests for assistance with. So yeah. my wish would be able to, is to be able to provide not only um, the um, personnel in the form of our patrons who share skills, but the um, devices and the um, space and um, other facilities for people to spend time learning from each other. I think that's oh. a really wonderful uh, ambition for the library. Oh, okay, it seems a little bit off the subject, but it sounds like a good idea. Uh, I'd, well, like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, can I give you my name and get absolutely. on your list? I, I'd like to see more of this from the sure. inside. Sure. It's board member Klein, yes? Yes, ma'am. And Erin, that'll be a good idea that way offline you and uh, board member Klein can talk about programming and I have his contact information, Erin. Thank you, Kara, that's great. Okay.
Thank you very much. You bet. Have a great afternoon. Was there anybody, did anybody else have any questions before Aaron departs? I am monitoring the hand raises and I see um, Vice Chair Smigelski has her hand raised. Hi, um, yes, this is Janet. I just like to say this is, everything you're doing is really, really good. When I was a volunteer, people would come in just raving about your ESL program. And I really commend you for all the different um, programs that are going on and your use of the volunteers. Um, could we have this slide sent to us? I didn't, I didn't receive it um, as a link or anything. Um, I would really like to have that if you could. Thank you. Absolutely. I can definitely send it to you. And thank you, Janet. I know you are one of our prized volunteers and we can't wait till you can get back into the library. I'm looking forward to that day myself. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. All right. Kara, is there anybody else? It does not look like it. Okay, then we'll go ahead and move on to our patron comment report. Um, Kira will present and discuss the library's patron comments in a monthly report. Um, this is for information and discussion as well. I don't know if everybody had a chance to look through them. Kira? Okay, thank you very much, um, Chair Raymond. And as I usually do, um, I read through these and I just selected a few that I want to address with the library board. And one of the first ones is we did have a patron comment that was submitted last month relative to library programming from a Miss Jennifer Tucker, who might actually be watching the library board meeting right now um, virtually. And um, Melissa later on in the meeting is going to be talking about the library's plan for piloting in person programming. You heard Aaron Krauss Riley mention the adult programming, piloting pending COVID, COVID numbers um, on the decline that we're going to start dipping our toe back into in-person programming. So we'll talk more about that later, but we made sure to include that comment um, about the question of when the library is going to be start doing in-person programming, and that information is forthcoming later on in the meeting. Um, also, as I look at my notes and the areas that I highlighted, because I expect the library board and the library staff are going to get more and more questions about when will the libraries all reopen. So, um, you know, right now, both Civic Center and Mustang libraries are open with reduced hours. We just launched the Pony Express um, at Appaloosa this week. We have had... Um, I've got a Pony Express update too. Let me get my numbers here in front of me. Um, 325 people have registered for the Pony Express. So that library opened up without staff on the floor, but the building's open, but Arabian is still closed. So I do anticipate the public um, questioning more and more on when we're going to be back open to full operations. And right now, the answer to that, similar to other city departments, we are operating on a reduced budget, which includes reduced staffing. Um, so right now, the plan is to operate as we have been. Yes, we're using the Pony Express and allowing access. We're very proud of that and happy that we're getting people into the libraries. If we can get some of those resources back, that would be our number one priority to expand our services. So I just wanted to let you all know that um, to expect maybe more and more of those questions because I've already been getting a few emails, I think, especially with the COVID numbers trending in a positive way um, and restrictions lightening up, people are going to be expecting that the public library system opens up. So um, we have got that on our radar and I just wanted to address that comment. Um, Finally, here, I also wanted to address the computer time continues to be a comment that we get a lot of in the libraries. And until we are out of substantial community spread, the libraries that are open, we still have a very strong focus on discouraging group gatherings. You know, we still have furniture taken out of the buildings. And um, unfortunately, until things are better and we can safely operate longer times on the computer and have more people in the library, we are going to continue on with that one hour computer limit. So that will continue. Um, there was another comment on there on when is the beautiful Appaloosa Library going to be opening. I just referenced that we opened that library this week, again, with a lot of work and a lot of planning, very proud of that. And the 325 people who are now Pony Express users will be benefiting and using that library. So that's the good news there. Um, so those are just the ones that I noticed and I wanted to call out here at the meeting, but I'm happy to um, answer any questions or have any other discussion on any other comments that any board members might have. Have relative to this report. 
And I see that Janet has her hand raised, but I don't know if that's from last time, Janet, or if that's you have from last, question. Time. Sorry. last time. Oh, no worries. No worries. Okay. It doesn't look like there's any other questions. Chair Raymond. Okay. I'm sorry. I was reading through, making sure I didn't have my notes here for uh, the meeting. I apologize. Hang on just a second. There we go. Oh, no, no, please um, no. The next item on there is the uh, item number five, library conduct policy update. Mandy uh, Carrico. Sorry, Mandy, if I pronounced it incorrectly. Senior management excuse me, senior library manager presenting the updates and policy changes to the library's conduct policy. Library board may recommend approval of the updated policy. This is for information discussion and a possible action of a roll call vote. Mandy, did I pronounce your last name correctly? You did, Sheila, thanks. Thank you. Which actually doesn't happen often. Usually people say Carico, so this is nice to hear. Oh. Um, yes, I'm here to present the changes in the rules of conduct policy. These changes are mostly um, for clarification. Um, the previous policy we found harder to enforce or people were struggling to understand exactly what it meant. We wanted to make sure that the language was very easy to understand um, and, and easier to explain. So you'll see most of those changes reflect that. So the first change we have is under regulations. Um, we have added the consumption of alcoholic beverages, it was not on there before, but it is something that we do um, want to make sure is clear in the rules. And if you'll scroll down, please, to the next change. And all, as always, at any time, if you have a question, you can stop me and I'll, I'll pause to answer the question. Um, next, in regulation number three, you can see that we struck through the previous wording, that small single um, that um, small single serving individually wrapped food items such as snack bars, cracker chips, or candy bars are permitted. We struck through it and we tried to make it um, easier to understand. We clarified to say that small individually portioned food items that will fit in a standard sandwich bag or similarly sized container are permitted. So that way that takes some of the ambiguity out of how large we mean by small. We also added that um, food that requires preparation um, are not permitted. We did have instances of people um, cooking, putting together meals there in the library. So we wanted to clarify that as well. Um, and then finally, in, in number three, we've added um, library material, materials or furnishings or um, library staff. Sorry, let me read the whole sentence. Any foods that may be considered by library staff to present possible harm to library materials or furnishings. And we added that hinder the enjoyment of the library by others. Um, so that way, whatever happens to walk in the door if it is somehow disrupting the greater good for people to enjoy the library, we can fall back on that. And the next item that we changed was regulation number four, treat library property, materials, furnishings, equipment, et cetera. With respect, we've added used furniture and equipment for the intended purpose. And that is just to help further clarify what we mean by with respect and how they should use it. Uh, the next change is in Regulation number eight, leave bicycles and gasoline powered vehicles outside in designated areas, carry or keep under a table or aisles, um, out of aisles, all skateboards, rollerblades and other personal transportation items. Do not bring any other types of wheeled. We crossed out conveyances and put transportation into the library with the exception of assistive devices for the disabled strollers or wheelchairs being used for the actual transport of a person or child. We took out the word conveyances because that encompassed um, suitcases and we are not prohibiting suitcases or other storage. Um, we, that is perfectly permittable as long as it fits um, within their space. So we changed it to transportation um, because if you bring in something that is used for transportation, we are requesting that it's being used as intended. And then the next change is on item number nine. If you'll scroll down, please. This is another change that we did for clarification. Previously, we limited the amount of personal property and we sized it um, by giving dimensions, um, 30 inches by 20 inches by 18 inches, which is hard to um, 
in forest or a picture. We don't have tape measures to see if this fits exactly. What we wanted was to get the spirit of what we're trying to do into the rules. So we've changed it to personal items, purses, backpacks, briefs, cases, bags, in total should not occupy more than a reasonable amount of individual personal space, such as will fit safely under the table or chair that is occupied. And the final change is in number 11. We added the word and procedures, comply with staff requests in regard to library policies and procedures. Procedures weren't in there before, but we felt that they should be because we do need that. Um, we do need patrons to comply with, with either or. And I'll pause and open this up for any questions. I see um, Frida has a hand raised and then Janet. We'll start with Frida. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mandy, for the report. And I'm, I'm looking at item number three up above, dealing with the, um, the food issues. Yes. So I'm wondering whether there was consideration of the type of food that's brought in uh, that would be more, let's say, liquid or um, something in the nature of pudding or something that is spillable that could create a, another issue um, as opposed to like bringing in a candy bar, even a sandwich was not really spillable. And also food items that may have an odor which can bother some other people. So is there any consideration of that? And I, and I think that might be something to think about. There are, we wrap it completely. And so any foods that may be considered by library staff to present possible harm to library materials or furnishings or hinder the enjoyment of the library users that encompasses maybe the spillable, whatever, what they might be using that might be spilled on and encompasses odor that might bother other people. We needed to make it broad because otherwise um, listing out all the different ways that food could, could um, affect library experiences, it would be too long. Mm -hmm. Maybe just um, in that in that sentence there, um, adding an example or two, like what was done later on when when you gave examples of of certain um, the uh, usage of the space under a chair. I'm just wondering whether it may be that some who read this may not make the connection with odors or with, with something spillable? We, can't, we could, even adding examples, um, because things like odor, because we also have um, like personal, like body odor and when we have to approach people because they themselves might have an odor, their food might have an odor, perfume, mm -hmm. it's all so subjective. So by leaving it broad, we're able to tailor it to the situation and explain why this particular food or this particular instant or this particular whatever is happening um, isn't working in that space, an alter alternative space or ask that they don't bring it. And we fall back on, on the code of conduct because it's, it's broad in that way, it gives our staff that power to be able to approach the different situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And you're welcome, Janet. Hi, hi, Mandy. Um, first of all, I, I very much like your changes and having worked the floor with patrons, I think these are really good um, changes. I do have a question and it, it's, it relates to this policy and the procedure. When a policy like this is changed and can affect patrons, um, and painters that aren't aware and they sometimes become upset because they don't know, will you be posting this new policy somewhere that patrons can see? And, and will you also ensure that all librarians or whoever's, all, all the staff are made aware of these changes so people don't, you know, especially patrons don't feel like, well, they're doing it for one person and not doing it, or this was the old policy and I didn't knew, know what the new policy was. Um, how, are, how are you going to make sure that patrons see these changes? So these will be, I think it's, yes, Janet. So these will be posted every time we make a policy change um, 
we post it on our website for the conduct rules. It gets posted on, on site at each library branch and staff um, after the board approves a policy is notified about the newest approved policy um, and that's posted on our SharePoint information page and emailed out. Um, okay, can I the, just yes. ask a question? Um, and I think that's great. I, I totally think that's great. I just feel that um, because this directly affect, affects patrons and can make some patrons very angry if they don't know or feel that they're being singled out, if, if it can somehow be very visible and maybe this policy change somewhere, um, multiple places so that people don't feel that um, discriminated against. Um, I will uh, I will say that this used to be posted on a huge um, poster foam board sitting at the entrance door when you walk in. And because of the length of it, very few read it. And so we found the same amount of discussion needing to happen, whether it was at the front door when they walk in or not. Um, what the approach we take is education. Um, when policies are broken, we educate them on what they are. We have this document as a backup to, hand, to give to them if they need it. Um, and if there is a major policy change, we do pull it out and post it. In this case, there aren't any changes. It's actually almost completely the same, just clarifying language. So we wouldn't pull anything out and post it. It just makes it easier for staff to communicate the rules and um, easier for patients to understand the policy. But if there was a, a very large change, for instance, the, um, the computers going down to an hour after they used to be unlimited, we post that everywhere because we know that it affects patrons. Um, but when it's small changes like this, then uh, mostly we just keep doing our patron education and we approach it as such that we just let them know what's going on and we show them the alternatives. And it only becomes a problem if they are well aware, have been educated and choose to break it. That sounds great, thank you. You're welcome. And I saw Sheila Raymond's hand next. Hi, yes, Manny, a question regarding the hinder the enjoyment of the library by others, that change that you have in there. Would that include um, allergy. So if someone has a peanut allergy, say they have peanut butter sandwich and you have kids that have a peanut allergy or my daughter has a cinnamon allergy, um, would that classify or because it's so broad that would be hindering the enjoyment of the library? Um, yes and no. I always say, because that could be who, that could be um, how do we how do we accommodate? Because there are many, many allergies to things that are very common. Um, and so it may be that the, um, the person holding the, the, um, the item that causes the allergy would have an easier accommodation, or it might be the person who has the allergy would have an easier accommodation. It would depend on the situation. And in cases where it is um, not widespread and apparent, um, for instance, like a cinnamon allergy that we wouldn't know about. We don't know to put that in the rules. If they let a staff know, hey, there's someone with cinnamon. I have a cinnamon allergy. We take a look and see how do we accommodate both um, to make it work. So it's really case by case. Okay. That was my question. So thank you very much, Mandy. You're welcome. And Fred, I see your hand up. Yes. Uh, I have a, a question and an observation. Um, both the parks and the preserve have lengthy, lengthy lists of user regulations, uh, much too long to be digested by any user. Uh, but they, they also post short lists of things that you're not supposed to do, uh, which people can read very easily. And I wondered if there's been any thought given to uh, condensing this uh, for poster purposes. Um, we actually pull some things out that are very important and post them in the area where it would need to be read. Um, the library is a, it's a, a center of information and we have to have a lot of signs for many reasons in order to get people to resources and understand how to use certain things. So we try to balance what's called sign fatigue and we get really, get yeah, we get really, um, 
intentional about how and where we post signs. So if there is something in our policy that um, applies to a specific place or we know would get read easily, that is pulled out and posted at the spot that they are using or where it would affect them. What do you have the most problems with? Um, the most problems come with sleeping, perhaps, um, eating in areas that they're not supposed to be eating in or around the computer. We, because we let in the, the whole public, we get the whole public's problems. So I like to say there is no day that matches another day. Uh, maybe you could take those problem areas and put them on a sign someplace so that uh, uh, they're, they're, they're clear to everybody. We Just do. a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other hands raised, Mandy? I don't see any other hands. Okay, very good. Moving on, number six is the library programming and outreach regarding fine free library. Melissa Orr, library senior manager, will present on the status of library programming and the outreach marketing efforts relating to Scottsdale Public Library being fine free, which is something that we can discuss. And it's also information. Uh, sure, Raven, this is, this is Becky Galvin Butler. Did we vote on the policy changes? Oh, we did not. Yeah, we, that is, we do need a vote. Oh, we, Thank we you, Becky. Vote. Yeah. Thank you, Becky. Um, sure. Okay, so let's go ahead. Thank you, Becky. We'll do a roll call vote regarding the changes to the library conduct policy. Um, do we need a motion? Yes, so we need to um, have a motion and have it second. So can I get a motion? Sorry. Mar Marna McClendon would so move the adoption of the changes in the policy as discussed. Thank you, Marna. Can I get a second? Sam Campana will second. Great. And then we'll do a roll call vote. Sh Chair Sheila Raymond, aye. Vice Chair Janet Smigelski. Aye. Board member Sam Campana. Aye. Sheila Collins. Sheila Collins had to leave the meeting, Chair Raymond. Thank you. Frida Hartman. Aye. Fred Klein. Aye. Marty McClendon. Aye. Okay, so we have that moved forward. Thank you again, Mandy, for going into detail and explanation. I appreciate it. Sorry for the oversight. Uh, Melissa Orr. Thank you for your patience. So if you'd like to go ahead and, and present the uh, information, that would be you great. Bet. Thank you, Sheila. This is Melissa Orr, and I'm happy to present to you today. Um, Aaron uh, Krauss Riley did an amazing job talking about our adult services programming uh, prior to and during COVID. And I wanted to provide a little bit now about our youth programming and the outreach that we've had. And then we're going to talk about uh, the in-person programming after that. So um, as everyone knows, programming came to a halt in uh, March as did uh, having our buildings open, but our youth services staff were amazing and they immediately began filming and editing virtual programs. They came up with great ideas like crafty story times and STEAM programs. And all in all, after looking at last year, 2020, we saw that over a hundred virtual programs for kids and teens were created with over 5,000 views. So our library staff were amazing. They immediately went into um, learning how to do these new skills that they had not done before because we were so used to doing in-person programming. Um, we utilized our library social media pages like Facebook and Instagram and really started utilizing our library's YouTube channel. And so on top of that, we had those staff members along with others creating new services like Bookmates Junior and Books to Go. So I really wanna commend our youth and adult staff and all of our staff for the amazing way that they pivoted so quickly in the things that they did. Um, the virtual story times, we were doing, were doing two of those per week. Uh, the virtual little Libros and the yoga story times, we do those. Um, on an as-needed basis. 
crafty story times. We do that once a month and we've had some amazing turnouts with those. Uh, people pick up their kits either at the drive up window or inside the branches that are open, or we bring it out to the curbside delivery. We've done pine cone, owls and snails. We've also done our full steam ahead program, which was uh, you would think would need to be in person, but we found a way to do it virtually as well. We've made ice cream uh, bubbles made into squares, um, making snow and zoom tubes. So those were amazing things that our staff has done during this time of COVID. Um, we also had an amazing um, support and participation in the summer reading program, uh, Imagine Your Story. We had over 2,700 participants sign up. And this was the first time uh, on record that we can find that we had a higher completion rate than we've ever had before. People were so excited to be engaged. We had um, the total packets wow. at the end of the uh, summer reading program for our patrons to pick up. And there was just a, a huge support and amount of um, participation in the summer reading program this year, despite even having some of that. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, it muted out of nowhere. Okay, I'm back. Hi. Uh, so again, summer reading program um, was amazing for adults and youth, and we, we had a, an amazing turnout. So we're, we're thankful for that. We also instituted some passive programs like Disguise a Gingerbread Man as a storybook character. Uh, parents could pick up the gingerbread man and they would go home with their children and work on disguising them. And there was a contest online where we had a winter winner, I believe, um, the Incredible Hulk was the winner. Um, if you look on here, we also had uh, sidewalk chalk. We had three obstacle courses for people to have in-person engagement right outside here at Civic Center so that they could follow along with um, this trail of um, fun. We had uh, things like uh, fall apples and penguins, and we had a, a Valentine one here just very recently. So we were happy to do all of that. Um, we were also able to have our family fun, Halloween family fun reimagined. You can see the picture here, uh, the second one down. Uh, kids who came into the library to enjoy the um, family fun. We had, um, I think we had about 300 people or so come for that one, 315. Uh, so we were still again able to engage our uh, patrons in uh, library fun, youth and teen wise. Uh, teen programming, we did uh, Harry Potter, sock, um, creepy sock spider, knitting programs, poetry. And over here to the right, you'll see the makerspace. We did receive a grant for $15,000 uh, to get makerspace material for our teens. And that's a 3D printer. We had um, Kids come in in their masks, they were our tab group, and they came in and um, was able to use the equipment after we got it installed this past year. We also continued with outreach. Uh, recently, we were able to take our Lone Ranger, which is the bike down there, Jennifer Wong Ortiz is um, down there in the far right corner, and we've been going out to day relief centers to help along with our uh, human services staff uh, to work with those who are experiencing homelessness. We've been taking out paperbacks and other materials for them to enjoy. We were also able to, with our second grade card campaign, normally we go into the schools and we work with the classes to get all of our second graders signed up for library cards. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that in person, but we did a great um, outreach video and we're making sure that all of the schools are aware of this program, that it is continuing. We participated in different parades. You can see down there the game parade where uh, the van has gone out into different neighborhoods. And we also participated in a local savvy um, Arizona drive through parade where over uh, 400 uh, contacts were made with families uh, during that time. 
Um, and we did have the Boys and Girls Club reach out to us. So we were able to also engage them and to keep them um, with some activities throughout this time. Any questions on the current uh, programming that we are doing? In addition, I just wanna say that we do have some virtual programmings that we're going to be adding to the lineup. We have a books and ballet program, and we're also going to be doing some of our knowing and growing fun and math and science series virtually. But one of the things that we all know that we're facing is um, our libraries are open. Um, we are going to start reintroducing in-person programming. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk to you about what that's going to look like in the upcoming months. So if you can see here, we are going to be offering a pilot in-person youth programming. Uh, this is going to begin in April and May. We are going to have one in-person program out in the community once a week. Um, April and May are still amazing times here in uh, Scottsdale and the weather is amazing. So we're going to be doing those in the morning and we're going to be doing them at various locations. So um, we're looking to do some here at the Civic Center Mall area behind our building. We're looking at Rio Montaña. That's a picture of Rio Montaña there to the right. So you can see um, how large that area is. We're looking at the railroad park and other locations that we're trying to secure at this time uh, to make sure that we can offer something in a big spacious area. We're also looking to have this programming be our books to boogie format, which if you remember, we used to do uh, what is called shake, rattle and roll. Uh, this is the new program books to boogie. It incorporates uh, songs and um, books into a fun time for our families. So we're looking to institute that back. It's one of our most popular programs and always has been. Um, so that is something we're really looking forward to getting back into the uh, lineup in our outdoor programming. One of the things that we're doing though, if you look at this, we say we're doing pop-up versus re registration. So one of the things to be able to do this is we wanted to be able to limit the amount of people at first to make sure that we are keeping everything in uh, guidelines that we need to. We want to make sure that our staff, that the public are safe. And so we want to be able to have pop-up locations where the families will learn just, um, it will be announced on social media 24 hours prior to the program. And then we will adjust based on the crowd size. And we, the ones for the um, registration, you will be able to register for these one week prior to the program. So we're trying a combination here of where you can register or where we can have you know ahead of time via social media where we're going to be and the, the location and everything at that time. We are limiting the attendance. Um, it will be limited based on uh, safety guidelines. We will have uh, social distance practices in place. We will have a area outside where we will maintain through stakes and cones and ropes to show that we have a particular space that's lined off. We're also going to have picnic blankets uh, to define a family space. So they will be able to know exactly where they're sitting. We will ensure that they are spaced the appropriate amount of space apart from one another uh, during the program. One of the things that we're saying that we're going to do is that the adults have to wear a mask while attending the program. Even if they can social distance, we still want them to have their masks on. Our youth, we are recommending um, to have them on, but kids under six are not required to wear a mask during the program. And one thing we want to emphasize too is that our library staff and the program leader uh, will wear a mask until the program begins. But once the program is going and we've maintained that social distance, um, they will definitely need to take their mask off because this program uh, is very active and we know that they need to be heard and that they need to be able to perform uh, for the program. 
Um, we are hoping that this turns out very well. Again, it's one of our most popular programs. It's something that our staff and our team have worked on together to find a way safely to put this back out there to our public. Um, we didn't decide on this lightly. Uh, we are taking the highest precautions. We're going to make sure that uh, everything is closely monitored. Not only will the staff be there to perform uh, the program, but we're going to have staff around to make sure that everyone is in compliance with the program um, to make sure we're all safe. So again, if this is something that goes well and we feel sure that it will, um, we would not be implementing it in the summer. Obviously, it'll be too hot to be outside. We are looking at having some in-person programming back in the summer that will correlate to our summer reading program, possibly in our auditoriums, as Erin uh, Riley mentioned in her adult report that there could be movies. We're looking to um, have some family-friendly movies that coincide with our summer reading program theme. And then maybe if this is successful and everything is okay uh, COVID-wise, we're hoping to implement doing in-person programming back out in the fall. Rio Montaña is an area that we're looking to build up out there. When we lost Palomino Library, we started doing in-person programming out of that little building there. We're looking to add more features in that location. So having the outdoor programming to coincide with some indoor programming during that time, we think would be a big benefit to our library system. And that is all on that. If you have any questions on that, program or any others, um, please let me know. Are there any hands raised? I'm here? not seeing any hands raised over here. I was giving everyone a second, but nope, I don't see any hands raised, Melissa. Okay, well, All thank right. you. If you um, have questions later, of course, uh, we would do our best to answer them. Oh, Janet has her hand raised. Yeah, uh, this is Janet. I was just wondering, um, Will the board um, members be notified of the schedule in case we want to come from a, at a distance and watch? Um, will you let will it, you send that out? So if, like I said, if we want to come and watch, uh, we could do that. Absolutely, and we'll help you, uh, or you can help us even maintain um, a little bit of the distance and uh, those type of things there for us as well, if you'd like. So we would love to have you, and I will send that schedule. You. You once it's finalized. Thank you. Thank you. Good idea, Janet. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Uh, we are on to the director's report. And oh, no. Uh, sorry, sorry, the next slide is about uh, fine free. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I wanted to quickly go over all of the ways that we have been advertising uh, that we have gone fine free. So I wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. Um, the very first thing that we can remember going back to and seeing in print was through the Scottsdale Independent. If you look down to the right on the bottom, um, April 2020 was the first time it was mentioned that thanks to our library board, which we again thank you all so very much, um, current and previous members that we were able to go find free. So that came out in April. Uh, we have advertised it in our Scottsdale life in the winter and spring. Um, we were able recently to get these ads on the trolley. So if you look in your top left corner there, all three, uh, sorry, all 21 trolleys um, have this advertisement for find free on there. We were trying to find a way to make sure our current users, maybe our past users, and maybe users to come are aware of this initiative. So um, we were trying to put it in places where everyone would be aware of this new initiative um, for the library system. It was also a utility bill insert we have created, if you see down at the bottom, we have bookmarks, we have flyers. We're giving those out at the libraries, at the drive up windows. We're giving them out at the different outreach locations that we're going to. We're also making sure they're in some of the other city buildings so that um, we can get them out in various places for everyone to be aware of. We've also done a big electronic push. It's been on Facebook uh, twice, Instagram twice. 
It's on our webpage. Um, it goes out uh, or went out in the Scottsdale update, update um, in July 2020. Our e-newsletter, uh, January edition. Peach Jar, it went out to every parent in uh, the city of Scottsdale that uh, attends uh, SUSD in January. It's gone out on Twitter, next door. It goes out in email notifications and we're looking to put it in our library um, in the next couple of weeks. So um, these are the places that we know of that it's been advertised. It may have been picked up and advertised in other places, but these are the things that we are aware of. And I know this was a question that we wanted to answer for you. So if there's any questions on this slide, let me know. Um, now I'd be happy to answer. Janet, your hand's up. I don't know if it's from the previous question. No, I'm sorry, I forgot to put it down, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. I'm not seeing any other questions, Melissa. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melissa, sorry about cutting you off. That's okay. Okay, so now we have the director's report and this is a difficult thing sometimes for our meetings is that Kira is giving us this information, a brief summary of the current events, but we cannot as a board discuss or vote on items that are not on the agenda, including items brought up as the direct, in the director's report. If we wanna discuss or take action uh, is required, the item should be placed on an upcoming meeting agenda to be consistent with the open meeting, the Arizona open meeting law. So this is for information only. Kira, take it away. All right. Thank you very much, um, Chair Raymond. And I apologize. I'm just noticing that I have the wrong date there on my <laughs> director's report. Today is the 17th, but um, I will jump right into this. I know we're running short on time and going a little over. So I um, wanted to let everybody know that Mustang Library did open up at the beginning of March, and we have been limiting the capacity in that building, primarily focusing on Fridays and Saturdays, since the library doesn't open until one and is only open till five. Thus far, that has been working quite well. And uh, um, I was there when we first did this, and I don't think we exceeded about 60, 60 people the day that I was there, but we are limiting to 75 people. So if we hit that 75, um, 75 mark, we'll ask a patron to wait outside until a few people exit. Um, I have to say that the public has been very, very, very happy that Mustang Library is open. So thank you, Amy. Next slide. Um, just wanted to let the library board know that we are going to continue here in the public library to be diligent with the safety protocols, and um, that involves wearing masks. We have been getting a few questions regarding why does a patron have to wear a mask if they are going through our drive through And really, just for the extra precaution and safety of everyone, we are asking that patrons wear their mask in the drive through We're asking that patrons wear masks anytime they are interacting with library staff. So I have had some people that are not happy with that, um, but really the library staff working the window, why a patron might just come through once in a day to pick up their materials, that library staff member really during a shift could really serve, you know, 75 to 100 people. Our drive throughs are busy. So really to protect our staff, to protect the public, we are enjoying having that extra barrier and safety precaution. And it has been the library's decision to ask and enforce patrons, unless you have a health reason, to wear the mask when you're interacting with staff in the drive-through. So wanted to make mention of that. Next slide, please. Also of importance is during um, this emergency state that we are in, and the mayor Ortega has an emergency memorandum, we are closing the areas outside of the public libraries within 60 feet of a public library um, outside of operating hours. Um, in part, this is to discourage um, behavior happening around the libraries when we're closed, whether that's um, people camping out near a library um, overnight or any time that we are not operating. So right now, under the emergency memorandum, um, areas within 60 feet of a public library are closed outside of operating hours. So, and this will be in effect while the city is under emergency um, orders and experiencing moderate, moderate and substantial um, community spread. Um, 
as defined by the Arizona Department of Health Services. So really part of the reason um, is if we have things happening outside of a library, right up next to a library, that we will um, be able to, PD can enforce and come out and ask people not to camp out or not to be right next to the library, um, hanging out and doing things that the library space is not intended for. So that is in effect now, and I wanted to share that with the library board. Next slide, please, Amy. Also wanted to let everybody know that, of course, we have a great digital newsstand. And with a new edition, the Wall Street Journal is now available as a daily digital newspaper that you can access on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. So similar and set up to the New York Times, patrons need their library card um, and can create a, a Wall Street Journal account to access this service. And um, this is something that Becky and her team have made happen for our public, and we are very, very happy. Um, that this is available for our patrons and wanted to make sure that the library board was aware as well. Next slide. All right, just for some clarification, I know when Chair Raymond and I were talking about um, this as we were preparing the agenda and developing it, we wanted to make sure to <clears throat> confirm and wrap up, especially now that there have been some changes on the library board who the library board liaisons are with each of the library branches. So what we have down is that the um, board member liaisons at Civic Center Library will be Frida Hartman and Janet. Mustang Library will be Sheila Collins and Fred Klein. Appaloosa's liaison will be Marna McLendon. Arabian will be Sam Campana. And then um, Chair Sheila Raymond will oversee all the coordination. So we have got the letter that was presented at a prior meeting. Um, ready to go and we can send that out so that everybody will send that out to the branch managers so that they know who their library board liaison is. Um, so if you have any questions about that, I know we can't discuss it now, but please communicate with either myself or Chair Raymond. So that is the library board liaisons. And next slide, Amy. All right, just a quick update here on deployed library staff. Right now, we still have five of our library staff that are deployed supporting other areas of the city. We've got two pages at uh, Vista del Camino. We have got um, a library aide, Natalie Mitchell, who's been serving as the management analyst. And we also have a library page um, deployed at the preserve. And we have a library page working um, administratively in the planning department. And then we also have Madi Whalen, who is our youth coordinator, um, is actually serving part of her hours supporting the city of Scottsdale's forecasting team doing research on all things COVID-19 to help city decision makers um, with planning around COVID. So I'm um, very proud that our library staff are supporting other city departments as we manage through this emergency. Next slide. Um, update on the Pony Express. I mentioned earlier that the Pony Express opened up this week. We are thrilled, and I know I've used the word thrilled a lot of times, but um, we are thrilled that the Pony Express at Appaloosa is open. 325 people are registered for the Pony Express, the senior team, along with the wonderful Appaloosa team who has worked so hard to make this happen. We're all there um, just to make sure that everything ran smoothly. We try to be careful because the whole point of the Pony Express is not, not to have staff on the floor, but we did welcome people in. They scanned their library cards, opened up the doors, and were able to use the library. So some great news there on the Pony Express. Next slide. Okay, library board and council, just in review to make sure that everybody is understanding how the library board can communicate with the city council. Um, I wanted to make sure that the library board knew that the different ways that we communicate with the council, um, that the library gets information to the council is that twice a month, we send an update on all things happening in the library to the city council. So that's included with any other things happening in community services. Again, that's twice a month. So myself, the senior team will put things relative to what's happening at the library, fine free, Pony Express, any of the um, important initiatives or things happening in the library system will get to the city council that way. Um, we also have the annual report that we reviewed um, um, at one of our recent meetings, and that is sent to the city council at the beginning of each calendar year. And then finally, the city council does receive a report after each of our meetings. They receive the report from each commission and board on what happened at each of our meetings. So that's a nice way for the city council to get information on what's happening in the library. 
if the library board has a specific initiative that they discuss at a public meeting um, and unanimously support a certain initiative, then the library chair, vice chair can set up a meeting with, um, with the mayor and council members to talk about that initiative specifically. So I just wanted to make sure to mention that. And again, if there's still any uncertainty or questions around that topic and we need to agendize that at a future meeting, we can certainly do that. Next slide, Amy. Um, Storytime Walk at Rio Montaña. Um, this is just an idea that we have got floating around and we're trying to hopefully get a grant to fund um, a Storytime Walk at Rio Montaña. Melissa mentions um, Rio as a place that we're gonna be doing some of our pop-up programming. It's where we have taken on a, a freestanding building that when it's safe to do so, we can offer programming. And one of the ideas that has been brought forward from Melissa's team is to do a Storytime Walk around that beautiful park, kind of hooking in park operations with library operations. So an idea moving forward and if we get funding there'll be more to come on that next slide amy library project update we are still um we are doing a phase one of the story time room which would be taking care of the staff space that's adjacent to the story time room or sky room as our architects has designed uh, right now the sky room specifically in the expansion um, of the story time room which the new name will be the sky room if we have our if we have our way and get this design approved um, that is part of the cip budget that needs to be approved as part of the budget process going forward so we hope to hear shortly on whether or not the cip project that are listed, one of which is the expansion of the story time room gets approved by city council. We will know that before the ending of the fiscal year. Scottsdale Leadership is doing an anniversary exhibit um, on the walls around the Scottsdale Heritage Connection. So as I get more information and images on that, I'll share at a future meeting. And then Celebrate Scottsdale Organizations is going to be another mini exhibit that will be on the walls adjacent to the Scottsdale Heritage Connection. And that is going to be an exhibit that recognizes 15 organizations in the city that have made powerful impacts on our community. And again, those are both kind of in the early stages of development, but I will share more on those as they progress. Next slide. And that is it. I know I went through that quickly, but uh, that is the director's report. Thank you, Chair Raymond. Thank you, Kira. So if there's anything that you'd like to put on the agenda, we'll have a, a actually that's this next moment. So the next item is the identification of future agenda items. If there are any items from the director's report you would like to address on a, as a future agenda item, if you wanna go ahead and signal that now. And then if you have any items that you would like to suggest for future agenda items, please raise your hand. And Kara, you're, you're observing whether- I am observing. It looks like we have Janet and then Frida. Great. Janet? Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I just would like um, to get a, an update on how, um, Kara, mainly you uh, are progressing with um, the, the last month's agenda item of um, the change to our bylaws. Okay. For the chair being able to run two years in a row if, if we could have at the next board meeting an update on that so we can okay. work forward with it okay thank I got you that listed thank you frida do you want to ask your question mm, yes, yeah that's you. a question we had yesterday too mm. yes thank you um i was wondering if we could have um a a short presentation on the Rio Montaña facility and area and like to learn a little bit more about um, what its potential is, what's there, what are we doing right now and talking about some of the future planning but, but more of a focused presentation. That's a great, yeah, that's a great idea because we talk about it a lot and I realized um, probably no one has been there except for the library staff. Great idea, I've got that listed. Thank you. Any All other right. items? I'm not seeing other hand raised here, Chair Raymond. Okay, great. Next item is the board members report. If you have, have a brief summary of any current events, something that you might have done that you wanna share. All right, we've got a lot of hand raises here. Okay. Um, I, I see Frida, Marna, Janet, and then Fred. Do we wanna start with Frida? And I don't know if your hand was still raised, Frida, or if you've got an update.
Okay, maybe. It was still raised, so I'll lower oh, it. Oh, okay, no worries. All right, Marna. So this is Marna, and let me just say, um, I've been to uh, Appaloosa and the Pony Express, and I was so excited. It was really um, very well organized when I did the drive-through with the paperwork and was then ushered into an area to park, and I had my interview, as did my husband. And may I just say, staff did a great job, um, how organized and how pleasant an experience it was. And then today, this morning, I went in and I got in. I wanted to see how that worked. No problem. Um, there were two people inside this morning. It was at about 1020 in the morning when I went in or so. And, you know, it just felt good. Everything was very well, you know, like sanitized. You just felt comfortable. The signage was good. So I just wanted to say from my vantage point, um, it's very exciting, done well, staff, kudos to everybody. And I know a lot of people worked on this. So thank you so much. Thank you for those nice words, Marna. And it looks like we have here next up, Janet. I just wanted to give my um, monthly uh, friends report because I attended every month. Uh, the friends now have 70 members and they are, they are having a high retention rate for existing members and members that are upgrading. The friends submitted, next time, the friends submitted a request with Harkins Theater for the free movie theater ads to promote the summer reading program in May. They're, um, the friends are waiting to hear back on that. And um, the friends so far have $25,000 in non-designated specific programs of which the, the hold it lockers could eventually be a part of that, but that's not decided yet. Um, the friends are also participating and I can um, give Kira the link if you're interested in the um, AZ Gives Day which um, allows people to go to the Scottsdale Friends page and um, make a donation. So that, that starts, I think it started yesterday and runs through, I'm not really sure how far it runs, but I think that's on the website. So that is my report. And again, if you would like the link, um, let me know or let Kira know and we'll get you the link to um, azgives.org. Scottsdale Library friends. Thank you, that's it. Oh, sorry about that, Chair Raymond. Okay, and then Fred Klein. Fred, did you have a question? Okay, maybe Fred, I see that he's still on mute. His hand is raised. Fred, I'm going to assume if I don't hear from you that you don't have a question. <laughs> All right, Chair Raymond, um, I'm not hearing from Fred. Hello, so. can you hear oh, me now? There you are. <laughs> I don't know how this how that happened. Uh, yeah, I was just asking about uh, in-person meetings. We were questioned about that last month, and uh, I wondered if uh, we're going to do that. That is a great question, Fred, and I know that Amy sent out a survey, and the answer to that is that the, we are compiling, um, we, are, we are going to put our name in the hat to be able to have a hybrid meeting. I know that the city, uh, city manager's office and the people that help facilitate all the public meetings are going to be taking all that input. Uh, there's only two locations in the city where you can host a hybrid meeting. Uh, one is at the Kiva, where they do the city council meetings, and the other is at the Nave. It's a building called the Nave. It's right on 75th. Fifth Street and um, Indian School, pretty close to Civic Center Library. So now we are going to request that the library does have a hybrid meeting, meaning that some can come in person, some can continue to do virtual, and we will just have to work. What could be different is the schedule. So depending on what other public meetings are happening, we might have to adjust our day and time of meeting to be able to host a hybrid meeting. And if that doesn't work out, we'll continue with the virtual. So Amy um, Herring has been working closely with that, and we'll keep us updated. Good question. Is that everyone, Kira? 
that looks like that was everyone. Okay, great. Great meeting, everyone. We need to, um, if I can get a motion to adjourn the meeting today. Marna, Ms. Linden. Marnie, Marna, you said you Marna yours? moves to adjourn. And and Fred? I'll uh, okay, I'll second. Thank you, Fred. All in, uh, I guess the roll call vote. We're going to start with the chair, Sheila Raymond. Aye. Vice Chair, Janet Smigelski. Aye. Board Member Sam Campana. Aye. Sheila Collins has left the meeting today. Frida Hartman. Aye. Fred Klein. Aye. Marna McClendon. Aye. All right. Our meeting has been adjourned. We will have to look and see what the next uh, meeting date is, by the way, because we don't know about the hybrid. So that would be a standby, correct, Kira? That is correct. And we will keep you posted right. as soon as we know. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. Thank you. Nice to see you all virtually. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.